It's Thursday, April 29. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In an effort to increase classroom performance, the Education Ministry will be moving away from a general approach to introduce a specialist teaching model. This was one highlight from Portfolio Minister Favel Williams as she made her contribution to the 2021-2022 sectoral debate in the House of Representatives on Wednesday. Currently, one teacher teaches all subject areas in a class. So the one teacher teaches maths, reading, writing, language arts, social studies, science, drama, art, religious education, civics, resource and technology, physical education, music, Spanish, among other subjects. Among the many inspection indicators that the National Education Inspectorate assesses, there is one that measures how effectively teaching supports the students' learning. In the NEI latest report, there are 202 primary schools that are ranked unsatisfactory and two that are ranked in need of immediate support in teacher effectiveness. We will begin the transition of having specialist teachers in our worst performing primary school as identified by the National Education Inspectorate. Minister of Labor and Social Security Carl Samuda says there has been an increase in contributions to the National Insurance Scheme, NIS. He gave an update during his contribution to the 2021-2022 sectoral debate in the House of Representatives this week. This has resulted in positive net contributions of $476.2 million as at February 28, 2021, moving from a deficit of negative 245 million as at February 28, 20. He says the positive turnaround resulted from various reform measures implemented on April 1, 2019. This situation is improving and we are already seeing recovery in the equities and other markets. As at February 28, 2021, the fund recorded a net increase in assets re returning from 2020 to 2021 of $10.5 billion. Minister Samuda says the fund is still actively carrying out redevelopment works for selected NIS offices across the island, despite the setbacks brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Commendations are being made to Caribbean leaders and the wider Americas for their work in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. Pan American Health Organization Director Dr. Carissa Etienne says the leaders have put health first with more than 317 million COVID-19 vaccine doses already administered across the region. Speaking at the weekly PAHO virtual press brief, Dr. Etienne says more vaccines are on the way. Simone Absalom Gale tells us more. The race to herd immunity continues with millions of COVID-19 vaccines being distributed across the Caribbean. PAHO boss Dr. Carissa Etienne had said the organization would continue to push for more. Of these, nearly 7 million have been purchased via COVAX and another 470,000 are en route to some of our countries. In the next few weeks, countries should receive their second COVAX shipments. And while doses remain limited, most countries should see a considerable increase in doses from the first wave. Just this week, Jamaica received 55,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine through the COVAX facility organized by PAHO and the World Health Organization. After accepting the shipment, Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton said it will be used to inoculate persons due their second shot in May. Experience shows that countries across the Americas have adapted COVID immunization campaigns to prioritize safety by designation, designating sorry, COVID vaccination sites away from clinics and hospitals, organizing drive-through sites, and hosting door-to-door -door campaigns to reduce the chance of transmission. Thanks to these efforts, our region has administered 
nearly every COVAX dose that it has received thus far. Our region has demonstrated that it can successfully distribute COVID vaccines quickly and effectively. Still, Dr. Etienne says supplies are far behind and the region is in urgent need for more doses. And that's why we want again to urge countries with extra doses to consider donating a significant portion of these to the Americas where these life-saving doses are desperately needed and will be promptly used. Dr. Etienne says expanded vaccination will ensure that people and economies can begin to reopen, rebuild, and recover. She says with the increasing incidence of COVID-19 variants of concern, timing is critical. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA, will be adding more social workers to their team roster to meet the growing needs of the sector. State Minister in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, Robert Morgan, says the move is part of the second phase of the merger of the Child Development Agency, CDA, and the Office of the Children's Registry, OCR, to form the CPFSA. This change will see an additional 150 social workers employed to meet the growing needs of the sector. One of the biggest criticisms, one of them that came out of the Capri report, is that we do not have enough social workers. And in doing our organizational review, that is something that was recognized a long time ago. We're happy to announce that we're very far in the process of moving to phase two of the, of the merger and that phase two includes the employment of an additional 150 social workers. He gave the update at a recent virtual quarterly press briefing. Minister Morgan also announced plans for persons working in child services. And a partnership with HEART has been formed to provide training and certification for all staff members working in residential child care. Homes. He said the CPFSA has commissioned several internal and external safety reviews. One of the important initiatives that we are seeking to enact in our management of the system is regulation of child care facilities. Both child care facilities within the government system, we have nine, and child care fa facilities which are run by members of the private sector. When I became Minister of State, I gave the CPFSA the mandate to ensure that we have a robust licensing regime to ensure that all our child care facilities are fulfilling the requirements to be safe spaces for our children. We did have some challenges where some of the homes were not able to fulfill the requirements. Some were not able because of the pandemic where the services that they would call upon to make themselves licensable were not available to them in the quickness that we would expect while some of them had institutional challenges i asked the head of the cpfsa to work with these homes to give them an extension to see how many we can get to fulfill the requirements former senator ambassador anthony johnson died on wednesday at the age of 82. Johnson, a member of the Jamaica Labour Party since 1980, was also a member of Parliament, economist and lecturer. He was first appointed to the Senate, after which he became the Member of Parliament for St. Catherine Northeast. At different times during his political career, Johnson held various portfolio responsibilities, including technology, education, industry, commerce, agriculture, mining and energy. In paying tribute, Prime Minister Andrew Holness lauded Johnson, saying, quote, he led a life that can only be described as selfless, having made invaluable contributions to both the private and public sectors, and as an educator, lecturing at the University of the West Indies for many years, end quote. Knowledge is power, and here at PBCJ, we keep you in the know with the latest financial market news. Here is the Business Report. According to state-owned oil refinery Petrojam, motorists should see an increase at the pumps in the prices of gasoline and diesel effective Thursday, April 29.
Following an increase of $1.91 each, 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $142.28 and $145.11 per litre respectively. Automotive diesel fuel will be sold for $131.16 per litre, following an increase of $0.96, cents, while ultra-low sulfur diesel is up by $1.17 and will be sold for $137.47 per litre. Meanwhile, kerosene increased in price by $0.54 cents and will be sold for $108.24 per litre. Propane liquid petroleum will be sold for $55.35 per litre, up by $1.70, and butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $55.10 per litre, after an increase of $1.77. Expect price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their respective markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE combined index advanced by 1,117 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 95 stocks, of which 41 advanced, 35 declined, and 19 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 27 points to close at just over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Blue Power Group Limited, Caribbean Cement Company Limited, and Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited. Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Barita Investments Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Variable Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and Berger Pains Jamaica Limited. Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with 8.7 million units, followed by Pan Jam Investment Limited with 2.5 million units and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with 2.1 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, April 28, the US dollar sold for an average $154.50. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $126.63. The pound sterling traded for $218.23 and the euro sold for an average $189.90. Oil prices extended gains on Thursday after rising 1% the previous session as bullish forecasts on recovering demand this summer offset concerns of rising COVID-19 cases in India, Japan and Brazil. OPEC, Russia and their allies, a group known as OPEC Plus, stuck to their plans for a gradual easing of oil production restrictions from May to July after OPEC raised slightly its demand growth for 2021 to 6 million barrels per day. The group also expects global stocks to reach over 2 billion barrels in July, taking them below the 2015 to 2019 average. Brent crude futures edged up 8 cents to $67.35 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures gained $0.12 cents to $63.98 a barrel. This week, our culinary trail leads us to Pizza Land. Enjoy! Pizza Land has been in Jamaica for a number of years. Originally owned by Italians, um, they decided to go back, unfortunately. So we saw the opportunity to take it up and make a purchase. I'm the manager over here. The general manager is Mr. Craig Bromfield. He's a Jamaican native, but he lives in the UK. We're keeping everything the same for now. Of course, we may integrate it with some Jamaican things, but for the pasta and the pizzas, there will be no change. So everything remains the same. We want to maintain an authentic Italian feel, which is why before they left, they trained my staff um, to ensure that we keep that same field. So Jamaicans are used to food a certain type of way. Italians are 
basically everything fresh herbs and spices so we want to keep that field here and this is why we don't want to change anything we have from pizzas pastas uh, salad sandwiches we have breadsticks uh, we have gluten-free pasta which is one of our best sellers okay our gluten-free offering right now is just pasta so gluten-free is uh, well, basically flour free from wheat and grains. So for persons who may have certain kind of illnesses, they can't digest gluten free, so we offer that option. There are other things that you offer, including sandwiches. Yes, we have sandwiches. Uh, we also have vegetarian sandwiches as well. So no meat, no cheese. Um, we do carry uh, dairy free um, cheese, but we're out of stock right now. So once you enter our store, you're greeted and you go straight to our sanitizing station. Um, we are going to be mounting one on the wall, which would be a little bit easier, but we usually don't have a large crowd in here. Customers can call in their orders. We also are working on some delivery options. Our first one is Peckish, which we're now online with, so they can order there if they don't wish to come in. If they are outside for any reason and there's too much going on in the car park, they can call in and we can do a curbside delivery. To build our own pizza, we have a basic cheese pizza. We have two sizes, we have nine inch and 12 inch for all our pizzas. They're all cut in eight slices. Um, so our pizzas we have from meat, vegetarian uh, and seafood. We also have two specialty pizzas that we do with barbecue sauce and Alfredo sauce instead of the regular marinara tomato sauce. We are located in Ligani Plaza and of course we're looking to expand into other parishes. Pizza Land is an experience. You can't find Italy in Jamaica and this is where you can get a piece of that. From across the region, we begin in Barbados. The government is taking steps to transition the local sugarcane industry from one of bulk sugar production to a value chain industry. More details from Barbados today. Word of this from Minister of Agriculture and Food Security in Dawir during Wednesday's handover of a new Chinese made sugarcane harvester by the Chinese embassy. He said that the sugar industry is in the midst of a restructuring that will see it grow considerably to benefit all Barbadians. The sugar industry in Barbados, as you know it, has been for many years operating at substantial loss to government. Government subsidies have continued to increase, 
whilst we try to grapple with the changes that are necessary to transform the sugar industry. The sugar industry in Barbados can no longer go on as a bulk producer for sugar that is exported at substantial losses to the BAMC. To that extent, the government is moving to transition the industry from one of bulk sugar production to a value chain industry. Therefore, going forward, the industry will no longer be producing bulk sugar for export, but has already started the process of transformation by producing sugar for domestic consumption and sugar for export for direct consumption in the international markets. Minister Ware also disclosed that a new government entity, the Barbados Energy and Sugar Company, has already been given the green light to take charge of the sugarcane industry with an aim of giving Barbadians the ability to become shareholders. Barbados is now poised to transform the sugar industry into a sugarcane industry with the focus on value chain development going from sugar production, reduced production for domestic consumption, giving Barbadians the opportunity to use its own sugar rather than focus on total imported sugar, and at the same time provide the rum industry with the premium side of the industry benefiting from local molasses. This transformation also will result in the BAMC earning more for sugar and molasses whilst we also look at the value chain development taking us to renewable energy, where by 2025, we should see the BAMC becoming a profitable entity with stakeholders involved and the ordinary people of Barbados given the opportunity to purchase shares in the BAMC. <laughs> this new entity will we call BESCO and is already um, a work in progress and we should start to see changes taking place in the industry so that all Barbadians will benefit from our sugar industry. And in St. Lucia, a police operation has resulted in the seizure of a large quantity of illegal drugs in a container belonging to a well-known business enterprise on the island. Stanley Lucian reports. Thing that law enforcement expected to find in a consignment of goods to a reputable firm with a long history of trading in St. Lucia. But this is the season of surprises. Stashed away in a shipping container was a huge quantity of illicit drugs believed to be cannabis. Police, with the assistance of partner agencies like the Customs and Excise Department, made the discovery on Tuesday. Police issued a press release on the matter Wednesday afternoon, which reads in part, quote, Units of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force conducted an operation, during which time a search of a sealed goods container was initiated. The container was housed within the enclosed premises of a business in the north of the island, unquote. So what's the value of what's believed to be one of the largest hauls of marijuana in the history of St. Lucia? Well, one would have to wait as the massive packages are being processed, that is, weighed and then valued. The storage of the huge stash of marijuana may prove to be a challenge for the force. The drug haul on Tuesday led to the Royal St. Lucia Police Force launching an investigation to get to those behind the importation of the illicit drugs. These are early days for the investigation and so far no one has been arrested and the name of the company at the center of it all remains under official seal for now. Stanley Lucien for the HGS News Force. Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith is hopeful that the recent drug and ammunition find will play a big part in cracking down on the illegal entry of weapons in Trinidad and Tobago. He was speaking at the TTPS's media briefing on Wednesday. Mahalia Joseph Wharton has more. Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith said there has been a quantity of drugs, firearms and ammunition seized through illegal and legal ports of entry. He said the caliber of weapons seized within the recent days were not just weapons to secure a tooth. When you look at the items that were there um, to complement the weapons, police sirens, blue lights, 
obviously it meant that they, there was an intention to be involved in something to bypass roadblocks and, and police, actual police officers. So obviously there, there is something, or I will not say much more, that is something that will be dealt with by the Minister of National Security. Deputy Commissioner of Police MacDonald Jacob, who is in charge of intelligence, said between 800 to 1,000 illegal firearms are seized annually by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. He said the recent seizure of narcotics at King's Wharf in San Fernando by officers of the Customs and Excise Division has provided them with significant intelligence to assist with further investigations. These seizures means a lot to us and um, the recovery of these high powered weapons, as we see, is very worrying, very, very much worrying for us. I just want to bring your attention again to recently where four firearms were found at the port in Port of Spain, where a person was charged coming out from a barrel at the port. He said many inferences can be made based on the items in the find. We are now looking to see what sort of qualitative information that we can get and the intelligence to see whether or not there is something that is developing. Yes, we are getting there. Um, our intelligence officers made particular searches um, at certain persons' home within, within the recent past. DCP Jacobs said they may be able to say more about the investigation in the coming weeks. He said for the year thus far, 115 murders have been recorded. 98 of them occurred with the use of firearms. Mahalia Joseph Horton, TTT News. And in sports, the Tokyo Olympics is slated to get underway on July 23, but on Wednesday, organizers warned that full stadiums will be very difficult. They pushed back a decision on how many domestic fans can attend until June. Overseas spectators have already been barred from the Games for the first time, and a ruling on Japan-based fans was expected by the end of this month. But with parts of the country, including Tokyo, under a coronavirus state of emergency, organizers said they needed more time. The Games open in less than three months on July 23. Tokyo 2020 Chief Seiko Hashimoto said it was not unlikely that fans will fill venues as in past Olympics. But he said, quote, to the extent possible, as many people as possible should be able to enjoy the Tokyo Games, end quote. Organizers also announced new virus rules for athletes, including daily antigen virus testing, up from a previous plan for tests, every four days. And that's our package. Thanks as always for making it PBCJ, the people's station.